here. We were looking yeah. at it one day and as we were talking about this, and it translates to dust. We thought, well, that's cool. But I think it maybe is related to auto dusters, which were worn at the time people were covering their clothing and open arms and yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm yeah. guessing that's probably what that is. Chances are they didn't have paved roads. Pardon? Chances are they didn't have paved roads. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. No paved roads, so you had to protect your clothing. <laughs> this is the Howell House. It was at 123 Third Street. The 1910 census has Kate living here with two servants and a lodger. So you can just barely see four women in the picture. Maybe one of them is hers. The, the house isn't there anymore. Oh, I know. So this I found fascinating. She died in 1911. Her full will was pre printed on the first page of the paper. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Wouldn't you think carefully about what you read yeah. your will if you didn't the whole world is going to know? So it gives the details of what went to various people, including furniture, china, jewelry, and clothes. So, for example, yeah. Lucy Somerville got furniture, jewelry, and all my clothing, wearing apparel, and furs. And this is fascinating. Her dressmaker, Delia Wise, got $1,000, which was a lot at that time. And her comb set in pearls. So she. Oh, okay. I thought it might have been a tornado. <laughs> Amber alert. Amber alert. Okay. So, anyway, her dressmaker must have been an important person in her life. And it tells us her clothing was valuable to her. If she defined which items went to which people, they must have been important. No specific mention of this code. So, moving on. I hate to leave Kate because I really liked her, but I, I found a friend in Adrian too. So this is this suit over here. I'm gonna flip this around because you have to see the back of this too. This suit belonged to Adrian Nosler Flenner. Look at the back of that suit. And we have Adrian's diary. Adrian herself was from New Orleans and Chicago, but she married uh, Merle Flenner from Hamilton. Um, so that she re lived the rest of her life after she was married in Hamilton. So we have her diary from 1897 until she married Merle in 1905. So she describes in her diary her, in detail her feelings for Merle and her introduction to fan, uh, Hamilton. So it's just a fascinating glimpse of courtship in the late, you know, early 19th century, early 20th century. So this is Adrian, a bit later, and I want to read an excerpt from her diary from December 7th, 1900, this is five years before her wedding, and I should have told you, this is her going away suit from her wedding. So you all know a going away suit, does that ring a bell? So after you're married, you put on something else to go away for the wedding. So here's her um, diary entry five years earlier. Quote, I started my 50 page letter to Merle today. 55 all <laughs> He came down in the evening about 7.45 and stayed till 10.50. I was again in an ecstasy of bliss as I am the only thoroughly happy one with him. The folks left us alone quite early in the evening, so we sat on the sofa and continued our good understanding of Sunday evening last. He asked me to be his wife, and I am the happiest and most fortunate girl in the world to have one so worthy, so good, so noble, so true for my promised husband. <laughs> To think that we will love each other through all eternity and live our life of love together, never to be separated. Oh, it will be heaven on earth. God bless my dear boy. That's sweet. And, and what you see here is the announcement of her engagement in the Chicago Tribune in the Society column. So I just wanted to show you a comparison. This is a suit that's in the collection at the Met. It has lots of similar characteristics. The 
long jacket, the detail on the top, the detail at the skirt. I don't know, you probably, a lot of you can't see the skirt, but it has a similar detail. And here's an ad in the Chicago Tribune. This is October 9th, 1905, so just before Adrian wore this suit. And in the middle, you can see suits for sale. So she could have gotten this suit at Marshall Field. Y'all familiar with Marshall Field? Oh, what a nice store. Um, yeah, now it's Macy's. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's fine, but. So the suits are $32.50. I did a historical currency converter and it converted to $1,000, but that, I, that doesn't take into account efficiencies of the production. It probably wouldn't be quite that much today, but the point being, it's a very nice suit. Mm -hmm. Here's the interior of Marshall Fields in 1905. So this atrium, if you've ever been in Marshall Fields, that atrium is still there. Um, you can see the way the women are dressed. They don't look a lot like Adrian's suit. This postcard is advertising. It's kind of like a fashion magazine in that it's exaggerated fashion. 1905 Marshall Fields interior. Here's 1905 Marshall Fields outside, people on the street. So you can see they're dressed in a whole different way than that more upscale fashion image. I think Adrian's suit is kind of somewhere in between. This is where they were married, Adrian and Merle, uh, in December of 1905 to St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Chicago. And what you hear, see here is the announcement of their wedding in the Chicago Tribune on the same day. So Adrian wrote in her diary that day, quote, our wedding day, a beautiful sunshiny day with the bluest of blue skies and not a cloud to be seen anywhere. It's pretty good for Chicago. <laughs> we were married in the chapel of the church in the presence of 75 guests. After the ceremony, we had a wedding breakfast at 1 o'clock. Now, what they called wedding breakfasts in those days were really fairly substantial meals. Uh, she went on to write, quote, at 4 o'clock, the carriage came and took us downtown to the Stratford Hotel at Michigan Avenue and Jackson Boulevard, where we will spend the first days of our honeymoon. So after that pretty brief description of her wedding, Adrian ends her diary by saying, quote, and they were married and lived happily ever after. That was the end of her diary. <laughs> so to me, it's very interesting that she does not describe her wedding dress. She doesn't describe this suit, but we do know she would have worn this suit or going away suit walking in the doors of the Stratford Hotel in Chicago. Um, we're lucky to have the glass negatives of many of the pictures taken by Merle Flinner and her family. This is a, oh wait, my God. There we are. So this is Adrian and the first Flinner baby. So this is the first picture I saw of Adrian after I read the diary. I thought, oh, there she is. I felt like I knew her, you know, after reading her whole diary. So we have quite a number of her suits and dresses. They're all beautifully made. They tell me that like these other two women, she also had very nice clothing in the latest styles. In this picture I put in, this is Adrian's mother walking the baby. So you're just gonna walk the baby down the streets of Hamilton and that's what you wear. <laughs> Here's the Flinner house. Um, it's on, Dayton Street, thank you. Um, Merle's practice was on Buckeye Street. Merle's family had lived for many years in an area called Flenner's Corner. Any of you heard of that? Okay, yeah. I think on Route 4, kind of near Route 63 in that area. No, I think it's Route 4 and um, Liberty Fairfield Road. Okay. That area, yeah. Right in there. <laughs> okay. I went to grade school there. Oh. That's how I know. Okay. And we had, when growing up, we had to learn to sing the school song. <laughs> <laughs> Every car trip, we were singing the school song of Flanner's Corner. <laughs> I was just going to say, was it called Flanner's Corner then? Yeah, it, it, my dad went there. And it was a school at the corner. It was called Flanner's Corner? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, interesting. Yep. Hmm. 
I'm probably one of the last few people in the world that know about <laughs> No, actually, a lot of people know they <laughs> So did you hear this house is still there on Dayton Street? Yeah. So just a few years after Anna Catherine, George was born. So what do you think? Does she still think marriage is heaven on earth? <laughs> Maybe. So she lived in Hamilton the rest of her life until she died in 1955. And before I leave these women, I want to say a little bit about them. They probably knew each other. Yeah, they must have known each other. They probably traveled in the same social circles. Maybe they wore these fancy clothing to some event together. So it's so interesting to come contemplate. So that's baby George. And this little suit is George's. Worn by George Flanner when he was seven years old. How can I be so... Yes, he looks little for seven, doesn't he? But look at here. Here he is. So talk about, again, an exciting thing for a costume historian to see is the exact date. All you have to do is count the candles on the cake. And you know he's seven years old, so this is 1916. So this style of suit was very common for little boys. Um, here's a full page of boy suits from the Sears catalog. Some you can see have an extra pair of shorts that go with the suit. George's suit has a tiny little fly front in the shorts. It doesn't button, it doesn't zip, it's just an opening in the seam. What year was this again? I don't have a date for this Sears cat. Oh, this is 1916. Yeah. And up in, you see in the top, over toward the right, there's a little suit that looks a lot like George's. But for these visitors, the boys uh, out there been made by mass processes or the individuals? This one is mass produced, and I know that because, well, let me tell you this first. I'm going to back up a half a second. See, most of the little boys are wearing either knee socks or long stockings. So if you're wearing long stockings, little boys wore these hose suspenders to hold up their stockings. Oh, I know. <laughs> so notice a, a children's size was 14 cents. So poor little George probably had on some kind of contraption like that to hold up his stockings. So these, this label is in George's suit. Um, although it looks like the Sears catalog, it wasn't purchased at Sears. After a bit of research, I know more about this store. A Star Best was a large upscale children's clothing store in Chicago. So they had a big store downtown. A Star Best, odd name for a store, isn't it? Well, I figured out it's, it was the name of a person. And I figured that out because Mrs. A Star Best appeared in the society column over and over. <laughs> so, and on the right is an undated catalog from the A Star Best store. So there's a little suit that's kind of like George's on the side. So where did George get this? Grandma's still living in Chicago. <laughs> Either they were visiting Grandma and they bought it, or my guess is Grandma bought that little suit. There's Anna Catherine and George. So what happened to the Flanner family? Both Anna Catherine and George went on to uh, live in Hamilton the rest of their lives. George became a doctor. Uh, the family had donated quite a few things, so we have some wonderful things of theirs. Anna Catherine died in 1967, and George until not until 1990. Wow. I don't know about the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Last thing, over on the far side is a frock coat that belonged to William Marginet. So what's a frock coat? Well, it's a longer coat, longer man's clothes that has a coat that has a waistline seam, they were very, very popular in the 1800s. But I think it was purchased in the 1890s, and I'm going to tell you why. They are very, very difficult to date because they didn't change much. I mean, men's clothing didn't change much decade after decade. So they did narrow the date, date down some. So here, here are the two labels that were inside the coat. One on the left from the manufacturer, I'm going to talk about in a minute, and the one on the other side. 
identifies the owner. And even that label was a little bit difficult for me because the very last letter, it's hard to tell it's a T. I figured that out after a while. So I started this story by exploring what Marginant meant. So this is William Marginant in approximately 1891. He was born in Dusseldorf, Germany and immigrated to the U.S. in 1854. In 1861, just a few years later, he volunteered for the Union Army and he organized a company of 48 men from Hamilton. So the company joined the 9th Ohio Volunteer, Volunteer Infantry in Cincinnati and Marginant was elected captain. So here's what I found just fascinating. This is a map that's in the Library of Congress collection. This is not Marginant's map, but this is similar to these maps that he did. So let me tell you about his role in creating these maps. He was appointed to the Topographical Engineers Unit, where he was involved in the compilation of the first detailed topical, topographical maps of West Virginia. So he invented this method of duplicating maps so that the union, units in the field could be supplied with maps that showed the roads, the waterways, other characteristics of an area. You can see that on here. There's a river, there's an orchard, there's a clump of trees. So these maps were printed on cloth, oftentimes handkerchiefs, using photographic techniques, and they were distributed in great numbers. So every unit had a topographical engineer whose job was to gather all the information possible of the area, where the troops halted, every day and report this back to headquarters. Mm -hmm. And then at headquarters, Marginant's people would consolidate all the notes, and the next day, maps containing all that information were in the hands of commanding officers. Think of how valuable that was mm -hmm. to communicate that information so quickly by hand, you know, all this work is done by hand, essentially. So Marginant came to be known as the Pathfinder of the Army of the Cumberland. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's so cool. So this is an ad that appeared in the um, Woodworker, it's the magazine uh, for people in the trade, in the industry, and it is for Bentel and Marginant in Hamilton. So after the war was over, Marginant worked as an engineer, and in the 1870s, he joined a company making machines that made wood products. So he and Fred Bentel uh, took over leadership of a country company. It was very successful. They made things like vehicle wheels and um, wood pumps. And it, the company lasted until 1918. Mm -hmm. So what else about William Marginant? Well, after the war, he married Carolyn Son. He had nine children. He was very active in the Hamilton community. I'm gonna read this off quickly. He was a member of the Grand Army of the Republic, the Royal Arcanum and the Military Order of the Loyal Legion of the United States. He was organizer of the Centennial Celebration in 1876, the Hamilton Centennial in 1891, the Electric Light Celebration in 1895, President of the United German Societies, member of the City Board of School Examiners, President of the Executive Board of Judges and Awards of Columbia Exposition, President of the Pioneer Soldiers and Sailors Monument Association of Hamilton, President of the Citizens War Committee in 1898, and first President of Mercy Hospital. Wow. wow. This guy was a big deal yeah. in Hamilton. Yeah. He died in 1900. Had any of you heard his name? No. Me either. Had you? Oh, for you. Two people. Maybe, okay. Yeah, a few. I was very impressed. So, but I'm back to the clothing here. So what about the other label? What you see on top is the label that was inside his coat. And what you see below is an ad for Stein Block clothes made in, uh, the ad is from 1901. So look at the match here. Steinblock was a manufacturer of high-priced, high-quality clothing, created in 1883, so we know the coats after that. And here's another ad for Steinblock coats. So during the late 19th, early, well, actually late second half of the 19th century, the last half of the 1800s, men's clothing was becoming more and more available ready to wear. 
there was this tension between tailors and ready-to-wear manufacturers. So the copy in the ad right underneath here says, ready to wear for you. So this coat was purchased ready to wear and as superbly tailored and perfectly fitted as made to measure tailored coats. So the ready to wear people are making their pitch for these are good quality too. You don't have to use a tailor. You can buy ready to wear. It's good too. I think the coat on the right here looks a lot like that coat. So he chose to buy ready to wear rather than use a local tailor. So where did he buy his coat? Well, he could have purchased it right here in Hamilton because Strauss and Company on High Street was the agent for Steinblock Coats. Yeah. Um, so this ad was in the Hamilton Evening Journal, 1892. I did not find this ad really interesting. The big letters say, made to order suit. And then right under it says, are not for, not a particle better in sewing fit or style than those of the celebrated Steinblock makes. So they attack, attract your attention with this made to order suit. And then they say, well, ready to wear is really just as good. <laughs> so you can see the prices here, 15 to $25. And another ad for Steinblock by Strauss, this time in 1894. Um, this time the ad says, same as high class merchant tailor goods, only there's an awful difference in price. Uh, and this was one of the primary arguments for ready to wear over tailored clothing. I thought it was so interesting that they had to add, we don't charge for trying them on. <laughs> so not everybody was familiar with ready to wear. So like the women we've talked about, William Marginal wore high quality clothing too. But unlike the women, fashion's not as important because it just wasn't as important for men in the late 19th century. And as women paying attention to fashion, margin it probably not so much. Yeah. How much would a, a ready, what was the price difference between ready wear versus tailor made for that kind of coat? Ta well, tailor made would have been more expensive. And if we look at, a, I think the other one was 15 to $25, yeah. maybe tailor made. 40, 40 to 50. So, but at that time, yeah. So last slide, this is Hamilton around the turn of the century. So just before this, William Margina would have been active, very active in Hamilton civic affairs. Pauline Benninghoffen would have been young, a young woman who had already been to New York and Europe. Kate Howell was involved in running the TV Howell st um, store. Adrian and Merle Flenner were just courting at the same time, probably all here at the same time, wearing these clothes. So I learned so much about these people, just following these clues. I learned about not only the individuals, but what life was like in Butler County at, the, uh, at this time, so late 19th, early 20th century. So, questions, comments? Okay, her daughter donated. Oh, so it was her daughter donated yeah. then. Yeah. yeah. But Anne did wear it. Yeah, yeah on occasion when it was, you know. Yeah, and I just have, I can't help but respond and say, oh, where to store clothing? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think it was often. I think it was just for the for an atmosphere. Yeah. And, and, people, and I'm sure she was careful because it's in perfect condition. Oh, people did it a lot. Well, it sort of is. It's it's not, a lot of these things aren't so good inside yeah. as they are outside. Mm -hmm. um, actually, we have, uh, one of the wedding dresses I'm going to put up for the exhibit is has heavy damage at the shoulders, which is very, very unusual. My dress is somebody wore it at some point. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do we know how much the coat costs from Paris? No, I wish I did. 
I mean, where, where do you think she wore it? The opera. Yeah. <laughs> the theater. I think, yeah. you know, Rich knows there were tons of theaters. Yeah. People got dressed up then, too. Yeah. 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 I mean, you went down to a, a Broadway show. No, not Broadway show. But there wasn't Broadway in Cincinnati. But. Yeah, and people got dressed up. Um, yeah, this is something I put on just to, yeah, just, yeah, this, just to have something there. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, when you mention all the garments that were underneath uh, the Benny Hoffman purple dress, by the time she's in the, the 50s doing this other dress, were, were many of those undergarments still being used? Thank you for reminding me. I forgot to show you this. This would be maybe from the 1920s. So by now, people are wearing much freer <coughs> underwear, and, and bras have been developed. I want to say invented. <laughs> yes? I can't tell from here, the gray coat. Is it a lightweight wool? Um, this one? Yeah. It's wool. It's wool? Not very, well, it's a nice wool. It's a felted wool, dense, but fairly lightweight, you're right. You can feel free to come up and look at these after. Your last name is Butler. I'm not connected with Butler County. I'm from Michigan. You're from Michigan? Oh, well, I have to come here now. Dearborn. Kellogg's Kellogg's Ford. <laughs> I'm Ford. You're, you're <laughs> 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 Is your butler name related to the founder of Hartford? No. I would be my husband's name. I don't know. I don't think he's that important. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't mean in general. I mean, I mean, his family. <laughs> You're exactly right. Yeah, I bet that's what it is. Even if there were multiple women in the house, you'd have to identify your own, probably. By the way, after a while, drawers became, I guess I don't have any out here, became closed. After the turn of the century, when things start, women still wore those long drawers for. 10, 15 years or so, but they were closed instead of open. Mm -hmm. wow. As clothing got less cumbersome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine even that dress. <laughs> Using a chamber pot? Yeah. yeah. I actually have a video. You can go on YouTube. <laughs> because, well, it's because people do reenactments. Yeah. And they show you how you use a chamber pot with all of this on. Wow. Not so bad. Yes. Uh, you probably know this book. I just recently read it. How to be a good Victorian. I'm sorry. To How you. to be a good Victorian. Oh no, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I think that was the title, but it told all the stories about how the clothing evolved and how yeah, the vessel on the back evolved oh. from the eighteenth you know, the Civil War. But um, talking about the corset. How miserable that would have been, and how yeah. they could never—they had to sit straight up. Really? And they forced them to wear them for long periods of time. Well, I mean, women wore them all day. You got up in the morning, put on your course and wore it all day. But you were used to it. You had worn it all your life. You started as a kid. You wore a corset. So, in some women tight laced. So a lot of women did not tight lace. Still. You're, you know, you're restricted in movement because it comes down, depending on how long it comes. It's the beginning of the 20th century, they came down long because the style was to force your hips back. So you couldn't bend at the waist, you had to bend at the hip. I think people fainted a lot then. 
Yeah, that's some of that's kind of exaggerated too. But there were health conditions related, of course. I mean, they just were. Yeah. This underneath, this is connected to the dress. This is what would have come up higher. It's just how it fits this dress form. But there's a built-in slip underneath or lining. Yeah, it wouldn't have been this low. Pauline wouldn't have wanted that, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.